connections, not too bad for the moment. So we're going to make the most of it as we can. Uh, uh, I would like to call everyone's attention to whoop, point the right direction. Dang, at our patrons, all the many people who have stuck with the old RJ thick and thin all the way along this past couple of years while I've been blundering along trying to make use of the freebie systems and to make them work. Uh, thank you ever so much. And we will now conclude all of that part and get to the matter. Oh, we're up to full uh, strength now. Replacing Darwin is no longer offering much in the way of sources in the reference notes. It's now into this kind of data field thing. But it's not that he doesn't have information that we can't play around with. So first off, He's uh, trying to lay out the speciation levels that are happening. And there's a big chart that he does that lists off the bovidae, all the cute little antelopes and bison and all the others. And you'll notice that there are all these little lines attached to it, little numbers that are genetic distances, which he is translating into diversification times, kind of willy-nilly. But... The other chart that he has on the other side is where he condenses all this stuff to this nice, smooth little line that looks like he's contending that cattle, sheep, antelope family, bovidae, are differentiating at a fairly constant rate out to their hundred-some-odd species, uh, all within a single kind, mind you, uh, from the period at the time of the Ark down to about 1100 or so years later, which means like 2350 BC down to about 11 or 1200 BC, that that's his argument that's going on. So let's start looking. Um, oh, and um, we'll also have the part two uh, that I'll be putting in the links uh, where uh, Phil Robinson in a post last year uh, was complaining about all that nasty feather dinosaur birds, uh, dinosaurs connections. And so he um, uh, dives into it with uh, repeating the mantras that birds and Archaeopteryx is not a transitional. He retreads some stuff from uh, Thomas and Sarfati in 2018. I'll be putting a link onto that. And you'll note that none of them specified what they would accept as a transitional form for a bird. That's the thing you should always be keeping in mind when dealing with um, any creationist saying, oh, there's no transitionals at all. Um, Nathaniel Jensen seems to think that creationists have always accepted transitional forms, but he's off in his own little corner somewhere. That memo clearly didn't get down to uh, Phil Robinson. Um, Robinson uh, also riffed off some papers that were actually way more interesting than his young earth creationism. Ones that identified a stray Archaeopteryx feather, uh, which is rather interesting. Uh, that's uh, K 2019. And then there's Carney 2020, um, which um, will be going into uh, evidence corroborates identity of that isolated feather as a wing thing. And then the, uh, the K paper is detection of the lost calamus challenges the identity of isolated Archaeopteryx feather. So there's a debate about whether or not um, this particular feather is from Archaeopteryx or something else. And eventually this newer study figured, yeah, apparently it has all the features that are distinctive that we can actually see in the Archaeopteryx fossil to link it to that. And it's found in the right area and so forth and so on. Remember, all the dozen or so Archaeopteryx fossils come from one deposit, the Solnhofen, which was an anoxic lagoon in what is modern day Germany, uh, sandwiched in between a bunch of other rocks uh, that all supposedly is happening during the flood. Yeah. Oh, sure. Right. Anyway, back to um, good old uh, Jensen and his cattle, sheep, and antelopes. Um, we started off, I looked at the listings that theoretically, he doesn't actually have a chart, an organization to where you can tell what data blips are actually being mapped onto what data blob on the other chart. So I just took two things that seem to be the most reasonable to be able to infer where they are on his chart. And that relates to um, the uh, little clip springers, which are little itty bitty antelopes in Africa that have a very long branch that by his vague description, it looks like those are early speciation in this process. And then the other one down the road is the Impala, not the Chevrolet car, but the uh, antelope from Africa 
that also has an extremely long line. So theoretically, Impala and uh, Clip Springers are diverging early in this phase and therefore roughly close to 2350 BCE, the flood time. Fine and dandy. That's what his argument is. It gets more amusing when we start looking at the technical work that's been done on those same things from the standard evolutionary perspective. And uh, fortunately, there's a bunch of little papers on that stuff. Um, one is uh, from Johnson and Anthony in 2012, which uh, pegs that these allied groups as coming around uh, the middle of the Miocene about 15 million years ago, way before 2350 BCE. And uh, that's about 20 million years after the early origination of the group of the um, uh, artiodactyls and uh, bovidae line that theoretically is a single blob of a family, um, that the roots of that are going way back in time, 40, 50 million years, not um, even the 15 million years for the origination of these early speciating ones, according to the Jensen model, as near as one can tell, since he doesn't list any of the details on this. Um, the things get really cute because what we're imagining is that, and by the way, the Duikers, these, uh, um, uh, they have some cousins. Uh, they're appearing uh, even later, about 8 million years, uh, more towards the end of the Miocene. So here's what we got going. Noah's kids are uh, getting off the ark and a bunch of them, one kid and wife, are traipsing off, breeding like rabbits somehow or other and populating Africa with the supposed Noaking allele for really dark skin and the particular hair features and all that that we see so characteristically in so many people in Africa. Uh, and that they're bumping into the animals that were on the ark from this kind that have apparently generated an offshoot that is now just blanketing Africa with all these little early generating species that are clicking off a hundred species in the course of a thousand years. And so presumably, what, a population of these antelope, and by the way, what do they look like? Does he tell us what they look like? What their genome might be? What the archetypal one from the ark would be that would be f the progenitor of all of this? No, he doesn't do that. <laughs> so what did it look like? Did it have horns? Short horns, long horns? Was it sexually dimorphic? Um, what was its jaw structure? What was his body size? Because all of these things have an enormous range um, in the forms, and they are coming in a thing where we don't have to have a population spitting them out as rapidly as a photocopier set on duplication uh, in your office. Uh, it seems the antelopes are a mess. I, I felt that it is going to be fun. There's a lot of material that I have that, that didn't have open access, but it's going to show up in volume two of the rocks because I'll be able to compare his description of things and what is all lumped together in a kind with what's in the Ark Encounter version of things. And uh, that's going to be kind of interesting to go, in particular, when we hit the bisons. Bison are also in this. There's two groups of existing bison. And by the way, of the critters that's on that list that I show you are in forms only. Oh, hello, Jay. Uh, we got a visitor. Um, bisons are cute. There's the North American bison, 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 and the European bison bonassis uh, that are the, or bison onassis. Uh, I'm not sure that there's any still living in uh, much in uh, accepting zoos in a few places. They're very rare. Um, no discussion of bison antiquus on his list, by the way, which is ancestral, uh, an older form. Anyway, if Jensen's charts are to be believed based on the length of the number spread to indicate when the species are supposedly appearing in the, the mix, remember, we don't know which one's which on things uh, exactly, him, he, and we can only go by the generic numbers that he's got on the list. He's not putting them in like a catalog that we can tell, okay, that's in that order. Uh, we've got a fun time because it looks like they're uh, 
arriving on the scene according to Jensen's model. Yay, great to know that the, the image is looking good. About 800 years after the flood, which is thus about 1500 BCE, by which time the Minoans are running around and you've got a whole slew of cultures around the planet that have all sorts of record of archaeology going on. And the problem is that particularly, well, the, 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 the bison, bison, the American bison's a little bit trickier because there's not a gigantic amount of fossil record, although you have bison antiquas. Uh, but the European bison comes up in a very interesting context because it turns out we got a pretty good fossil range for the Eurasian examples. And I'll be putting a link up to uh, a paper. Unfortunately, I think it's only read only, but you'll be able to take a look at it. Uh, Beneke 2005, um, which goes into that and plots them all out. And then the cherry on top of the Sunday, um, Sobriere 2016, uh, which is about the fact that the Europeans over the course of many thousands of years, 21 to 18,000 years ago, painted pictures of the bisons in their cave art at Altamira and Laskow. And they're tracing the shifts in groupings between these various uh, portions of the European types that, that extinct forms that we know of um, are actually being depicted uh, in these uh, uh, art paintings. Um, is all this happening in 1500 BC? <laughs> Around the times the Minoans are building Canassus and uh, you've got the Egyptians long after the Pharaoh era building pyramids. Uh, you're into a, you're in, uh, sliding in through the uh, Middle Kingdom into the New Kingdom. I mean, it, does he realize what the hell's going on here? I really don't think so. <laughs> But it is absolutely fascinating that, well, to be fair, um, Jensen has admitted he hasn't studied history. And shocked, shocked to hear that because it like shows. <laughs> but the problem is, is that he isn't even studying the implications of the works he's bringing up. If he's going to bring up a taxa and you're going to argue, you got a cute little chart that shows it appearing over the X amount of time. Can you be a little more detailed on that? And so, frankly, this particular chapter, that's the end chapter of the book, where the rubber hits the road, or what we're getting in the way of footnotes, let me show you this so you can marvel at what I'm trying to deal with here. We're getting uh, note 15. Uh, These results were obtained through my own personal analysis, he says. Sequences were downloaded from the NCBI database ascension numbers. And so what we get is a mass of ascension numbers, which all relate to particular genomes, that he's listed them off. And therefore, presumably, anybody that wants to follow this up, uh, hear that, Dan Stern Cardinale or, or uh, Joel Duff, will have to plow through that online data field just to get the little blips and then figure out how he's analyzing them, because he's not describing the methods, as far as I can tell, if other people who have read uh, Jensen, uh, Dan Stern, Cardinale, and Joel Duff in particular, uh, have seen, uh, or uh, um, um, our dear friend, Neff, um, if uh, you've also looked through this stuff, are familiar with it, you can please me, am I missing something? Or is there any methods details anywhere in the book explaining how he's taking this stuff and transforming them into the grid that gets plopped onto the chart. This is the same kind of a problem that um, I encountered in that 2019 paper uh, that I've kind of hit a, a, a stumbling block is to try to work out what his later charts are as to how he assembled them. Uh, only one of his charts was I able to actually ferret out. Uh, oh, just <laughs> yes, yes, oh, well. Yeah, just because a bunch of people live flood doesn't say that they live through, didn't live through the flood. Yeah, um, and, and uh, the, the most we can say, and we'll be to this in a laboriously hilarious tale in Volume Two of the Rocks Were There. Uh, the big slosh chapter um, is going to be going into uh, the mythology about and the, the the paleontology and everything about what our pets are and what 
um, diseases were around and what our domesticated crops were. There's a whole slew of stuff that all relates to the data field that the creationists need to account for. And all we're getting is the most superficial cartoon that you could possibly imagine. Everybody is just going, well, it, it had like created heterozygosity. Okay, can we be more specific? It's coming from the animal kinds. Uh, okay, can we be more specific? <laughs> and it, it, the reason why I make such a big deal about making sure that the links are available so that everybody can follow up, that all the links that I put on these uh, videos will be open access stuff, the full shebang text, that you don't have to deal with just a little bitty abstract, that you can look at the whole thing and play around with it yourself and do your follow-up research and explore as you wish. Um, um, that's up to you to deal with. And, and ideally, if various people um, have particular disciplines, they're all going to have their own particular sidebars. Um, this one um, is for you, uh, Gutsit Gibbon, uh, for the um, next show, <laughs> in fact. Um, will be uh, right up your alley, which is this chart that he does about the old world and um, uh, the old world monkey species, which therefore suggests that he's regarding the old world monkeys as uh, a, a separate kind from any of the others. And it'll be kind of fun to see how he plays around with that little funky. Um, It's going to be interesting to see what's going to happen with Jensen, who's already been dumped on by Robert Carter. Uh, we'll be alluding to it in volume two of The Rocks with there. Anybody that's been following Old Duff um, and so forth uh, that Dan Stern Cardinale has had will be aware of the fact that creationist geneticist Robert Carter has expressed a very dim opinion, very politely worded, but it's still a very dim opinion of the new traced book that uh, Jensen came up with, which according to Jensen is the most, it's the Rosetta stone of, of the creationist material. It's the key, the mitochondrial DNA haplotypes opens up the whole world and explains everything. And Carter is going, no, <laughs> it's not. And, and it's, it's not because Carter doesn't also believe that everything is happening post um, flood only uh, 4,500 years. It's that trying to rest it on the methodology that he's doing, which is taking these haplotypes and translating them somehow into population blobs that you can arrange like little chess pieces and you arrive at absolutely preposterous conclusions. Even Carter is pointing that out, that it gets to things in the uh, uh, arrivals in the new world that's just nonsensically recent. And maybe if he knew more about history and the archaeology uh, of the period, um, maybe he lives in the United States, doesn't he? Doesn't he get around? <laughs> I mean, yipes. Uh, uh, this, this is absolutely ridiculous. So um, it's going to be kind of fun to see um, just exactly where modern creationism is going to go on this, that you've got the new creationists and Joel Duff keeps a really close eye on that. And so I let him um, alert me to a whole bunch of little things that pop up. For example, uh, the issue about whether or not there oh, some group of creationists will be okay with feathered dinosaurs. And so there's blocks of the new creationists that are basically throwing in the towel on this. They're not claiming that birds evolved from dinosaurs, heaven forfend, but that uh, they can no longer defend the scenario that if it's got feathers on it, it's got to be a bird. Sorry, too many taxa with too wide a variety and clearly not aviala that are in the dinosaur branch. Um, how they're going to hair split beyond that, it'll be fine, fun to see, but you've got a, a, a bunch of messes. And another one that um, um, Joel Duff took note of uh, in one of his recent videos uh, has to do with how um, Guliuza, who is now the head of Institute for Creation Research and basically puts all sorts of his own little notions about natural selection is not a thing 
in Acts and Facts. Uh, it's uh, got to the point where Jason Lyle has disconnected himself from the Institute for Creation Research. And he literally tells um, people very gently on apparently some videos that ICR is unreliable. <laughs> you just can't accept anything. They're totally, totally off the wall. You can't accept anything they say on information anymore. So it's going to be really fun to see what's going on in this infighting as the old guard of dogmatists that are petrifying brains in ICR and AIG and to some extent CMI are then interacting with the new generation of soon to be petrified brains that are trying to figure out how they can shuffleboard the little bits of the pieces and accept more of the information without actually giving in on the core dogmas if they can figure out what the hell those are. Other than everything has to be recent, uh, but when did the flood start and stop? Um, there's uh, quibbles about whether or not that, well, because there's fossils that exist after the dinosaurs. They may, in order to account for the Green River and a lot of these, these are post Cretaceous deposits. And the very arguments that they use that require that really beautiful Lager State and deposits must be catastrophic flood forces them to draw the line for the flood way after the Cretaceous. Most creationists are really uncomfortable with that. They like the Precambrian as the created rocks and then all that Paleozoic, Mesozoic stuff as the flood. And then afterwards, boom, they get in there. Oh, hi, Ian Chan. How are you doing? Bingo. It's the advantage, I guess, of Lynn being in a time zone that is congenial to one o'clock in the morning here in Spokane. I think that's how it works. <laughs> I, uh, Ian has been such a wonderful supporter, not just for me, but for everybody. He's He's been um, a, uh, a, and would send books to people uh, that, um, uh, to uh, uh, spread things, and as well as sending some of my books out uh, to people uh, to uh, keep everything going in there and, and has managed to debate um, with the dear Kent Hovind more often than I have, because for some strange reason, Kent Hovind does not seem to want to rematch with me. I can't figure out why that could be. Yes, you can catch me weekly now. Yeah, 6 p.m. there in uh, in New Zealand. Uh, it seems as though, although there are occasional blips and foibles at this hour, um, it's pretty clear. And I was having doubts about the, the old time zone to begin with when I was noticing how many of the people in our network, including Dan Stern Cardinale, tended to do their videos right around the same time I was doing mine. And uh, that meant that um, there's probably a whole world of people doing stuff around the same time. And my poor little freebie uh, connection way down here in the basement uh, was running into too, too much competition. So there we go. Uh, oh, you're in Australia. I thought you were in New Zealand. My, 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 my bad. They're, they're close. They're close. And uh, um, it's uh, part of my brain actually is is uh, in Australia because it figures in uh, the Paralogs of Phileas Fogg, Volume Two. Uh, this will be while I've got a good connection. Yes, we'll we'll um, let uh, Ian uh, um, hear on this. For one thing, I will have them correctly pronounce it Melbourne rather than Melbourne. Uh, and uh, it's uh, in the period from 1873 when uh, uh, Melbourne was just starting up. You can correct me on the history on here or nod uh, pleasantly. Um, that uh, they were the really hot spot. There had been gold strikes in the area, that it was just the really razzle dazzle growth town of that period, way more than Sydney and some of the other places that would eventually pick up steam uh, later on. Um, and what intrigued me about so much of it. Uh, it, there was one not bad hotel in Melbourne at that time, uh, it, which we're talking December 1878. Uh, oh, no, that's, uh, that's in, uh, wrong, my mistake. Um, in uh, oh, 18, I'm trying to get my chronology straight. Anyway, it's in the 18, early March of 1873, around in that period. And uh, a, a really giant hotel, the first really big, big, big one, uh, was built quite a bit later, and the and the one that they stay at in the uh, in my story is uh, a pretty good size, but it was expanded quite a bit, and I think it went out of business in the 1950s, 60s, somewhere around in there. So I mean, think things transformed, but I tried to get the landscape of the place uh, correct, the Yarra River, and uh, the there there was um, 
a surprisingly large, I think it's probably because of the colonial aspect, that there it had an awful lot of amazingly elaborate mansions uh, built in the 1850s, 60s, and 70s, and which meant that compared to San Francisco, um, yeah, yes, I can, I can easily, I can easily believe that. In fact, I've got a little bit about um, uh, they had a uh, a big mint uh, there. I think it's still there, uh, but it had it been built. I seem to think in the 1860s. Yes, I just remember to tie the kangaroo down. Sport. Oh dear. <laughs> yeah, the didgeridoo and all of that stuff there. Yeah. Um, and uh, but I had to kind of do some re background research to try to figure out how. Um, where I would have an isolated spot where this airship thing is built uh, in the story. And um, so it's out east of town, up in the uh, hillsides area, out past there. There was quite a lot of logging that was done, and there were sawmills that had started to fall into repair. They had gone out of business. It kind of a boom and bust cycle out in there. Uh, a lot of vineyards and uh, or, uh, you know orchards and that sort of thing that's going on, but it was sufficiently rural. And then there's a thing that eventually became like a national park out farther beyond that's just in that adjacent area. So I think I've got that spot not too badly structured. I don't know whether or not Australia is going to figure much in any of the later stories or not, but so the, the 1870s, I'm diving in with a vengeance uh, to deal with it. But uh, it makes San Francisco very different that which we saw in the first novel, um, uh, where most of the Knob Hill mansions hadn't been built yet. And San Francisco really surprised the bejabbers out of me uh, in 1872 of how so much of what I associated with the place, cable cars and all that, it didn't exist yet. So anyway, and why will my boomerang come back? Here we go. Well, you got to make sure the batteries are fresh. If you don't recharge your boomerang properly, you know, it can just easily go off and try to mate with a... a, a whatever a boomerang would mate with. I'm a little too late for me to figure out on that. Anyway, <laughs> I'll, I'll give a, also a, um, uh, a shout out to um, the upcoming material that's going to be in Rocks 2 on the, um, uh, the various uh, new technical papers and things. I'm trying to keep track of stuff on um, some origin of life material that's been coming along kind of recently that's relevant, uh, stuff on the mutation rates in, in yeast that uh, uh, Georgia Purdom riffed off of in a recent AIG thing. That's going to have to be brought up. Oh, yes, yeah, yes, <laughs> yes, uh, intrigued about the fiction books. Uh, if you want to get some a, a, a pleasant little read, um, pick up the paralogues of Phileas Fogg, and hopefully I'll be, I promised my niece and her husband that I will have the second novel out uh, before I go over for my birthday in September. So I'm just finishing up that elements of it. Um, it's, it's given me a beautiful relaxation time from working on the science stuff because part of my brain, when you're dealing with science material, it's all rigorous footnoting, it's careful documentation, it's pay attention to the fiddly bit details and the footnotes and the working through and the hypothesis and seeing how well the evidence supports all of that. There's a whole set of procedures that are necessary in writing science works and hopefully I'm succeeding in what we've come up with so far in rigorously making an argument, documenting it. When you go into fiction mode, now you have a totally different framework you can deal with high concept things. You can deal with inventions that are impossible. Uh, but yet, if you can just run with it like Twilight Zone would, as H.G. Wells did. Uh, and so I've, and I've always loved the Victorian and Edwardian era. I'd even done a little bit of historical fiction that still is lurking in the back of my brain. Uh, will your chewing gum lose its flavor on the bedpost overnight? Boy, we are just running along. <laughs> This is like golden oldie week, you know. Uh, that's like what 1967 or eight, somewhere around in there. And uh, there were, were a lot of little. Uh, well, uh, periodically there are wacky uh, nonsense songs that pop along, and that was one of those. It was the same uh, genre as Merzydotes was in the 1940s. Uh, another one was um, 
uh, your red scarf matches your eyes. You closed your cover before striking. Mother's got the sh father's got the ship fitters blues. Loving you has made me bananas. It was kind of a riff off of the um, um, kind of very Art Deco-y 1930s vibe uh, that pops along, and I think that also fell into like the 1960s period. Uh, so this is uh, this is all stuff that is way older than even most of the people in my audience. It's older than you, Ian. So I can expect uh, that uh, uh, we can easily overlook that stuff. Um, anyway, um, so my mind can relax by escaping to the the fictional writing, where now I'm dealing with mystery and science fiction and historical period, and now I can look into layers and layers of fun stuff. And I love writing clever. Um, smart ass dialogue. Um, if you've ever seen, I'll give you some spoiler alerts that won't spoil it, but still. Um, if you're aware of Around the World in 80 Days, uh, you won't actually have to ever read the Jules Verne novel because I've embedded the whole bloody thing <laughs> in um, the Paralogues of Phileas Fogg. And if you've seen the recent uh, um, uh PBS version, it was from the BBC, I think, um, which was a retelling of Around the World in 80 Days with uh, oh, um, Daniel Tennant, I think, that was one of the Doctor Who guys. And it was a very cleverly done kind of woke retelling of things. Uh, it did make a few little stretches in chronology and um, uh, revamped the entire plot, rechanged all of the character structure, uh, made Passepartout a black guy from uh, and uh, the good performances, clever writing, and, and a lot of interesting bits about it. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, keep on keep on driving everyone up on the uh, um, volume two. It it should be about the same physical dimensions as volume one, and um, it's structured with the same number of chapters. Chapter one will be a breakdown of uh, the newer material that's popped up since the first book appeared that relate to the various issues that we brought up in the in the earlier chapters. Then there will be my two biggies, uh, which is the big slosh uh, chapter, and we're also going to have specialized appendices because it's what started out as an info box ballooned to the point where I realized we'd have to have these as, as separate bits. I We will have an, a breakdown of the ARC encounter kind list, now that that's accessible, kinda, to where you can actually get a listing of it, and compare the different creationist accounts of why are they deciding which kinds are which, and why is the list in the order that it is? It's not alphabetical, so why are they picking it in the order that it is? It's because they're following the evolutionary cue sheet. So there's that parasitism yet again from people who, who haven't really invented anything. They're just trying to figure out how to shuffle it to make it fit their, their model. Uh, and then there's going to be um, a, an appendix which will cover um, the um, legends of the flood that supposedly are worldwide. Um, there's an awful lot of them, but they fall into a relatively narrow set of categories. People who live in rivers that flood, for some strange reason, have flood stories. Uh, except in the case of Egypt, it's not a bad flood story. It's a, yay, the river's flooding. And it's when the river doesn't flood that it's in a mess. Uh -huh. Oh, yes, that one. Uh, seeing how YECs can even disagree amongst themselves is always a source of amusement to me. Yes, I agree completely. And and it, it's a thing to keep an eye out if you are following the creationism venue as somebody that wants to criticize it or do videos or write books or anything about it. Keep in mind that the disagreements that take place among creationists are almost never discussed in their upper public uh presentations. So if you go through reams of Institute for Creation Research Acts and Facts back issues, and I'm doing it, or posts at Answers in Genesis, uh, or and, and the stuff that would be the online material, CMI the same way, Creation Ministries International, which is the other half of Answers in Genesis had the, after they had their messy divorce in like 2005 or so, and they separated the which magazines went to which group and so forth and so on. Um, the only place you're going to see mention of these giant controversies is buried in the footnotes and on the sidebars of stuff. And, and uh, for example, the um, 
Oh, um, do I think there'll be, there shouldn't be a need for rocks volume three. Um, a lot of the topics that we might've been tempted to go into uh, in this, um, either one of the volumes are gonna be actually separate books. Uh, Jackson and I have plans to do a work on um, conspiracy thinking, which is gonna bring up stuff about flat earth and COVID conspiracies and uh, a whole bunch of stuff in, in, in those regards. And this brings up the kind of the, the wacky undercurrent that exists in the creationist movement and elsewhere. Uh, oh, didn't the kangaroos get to Australia by jumping into volcanoes? No, those were the koala bears that were catapulted ballistically. <laughs> that idea went in and out of creationism at CMI really fast. I think that was about 2009. It went down faster than the Lusitania. Uh, anyway, um, the material that, that occurs in the creationism movement on the heat issue and whether or not catastrophic plate tectonics works, whether floating forests will work, um, all of that stuff, or whether natural selection is a thing. Um, it's only when you can see the footnotes in some of the, their posts and some of the articles in the more technical things that the Journal of Creation, which is uh, Answers, in, uh, or Answers in Genesis uh, brand, and then the uh, Answers Research Journal as well, um, and, uh, oh no, General of Creation is Institute for Creation Research. And, and um, then you still have the old granddaddy. They still do articles there. Not all of them are open access, although the older stuff pretty much is. Um, uh, the Creation Research Society Quarterly, CRQ, uh, some of Armitage's stuff was in that. Uh, oh, haha. <laughs> Yes, Dr. Dan, Dan Cardinale, and if you're not following Dan Stern Cardinale, what else wrong with you, uh, is doing something intriguing, and that's pointing out why he sees that are diametrically opposed to each other's position. Neanderthal hypermutating versus inbred. Yes, that that will be alluding to that in the uh, the volume. Um, I, I've been I collected a huge amount of material for the last twenty years on the human evolution angle the genetics, the development of culture, the advent of fire, the various systematics on the various taxa and all of that. And so it's all been zoned as the material that will be deployed in the human evolution chapter in the new book. So there's going to be the human evolution stuff. There's going to be detailed material on the origin of the tetrapods, uh, TikTok, we allude to it, it little bits in the first book, but we're going to dive into how the creationists have mangled this one and also how much of the genetics and biology predate things. One of the, the, the take home images that I hope everybody uh, gets um, is that in actual evolution, you have all of the genes and basement material that manifests itself in the physical shape of uh, individuals within a population of organisms. None of those genes for all practical purposes have originated on the spot. That, you know, uh, you find creationists constantly going off on, well, how did, how did a, a thing develop an arm and a heart and, and, and all the things that are needed to do hearts and the eyeballs and the brain to attack? Well, it didn't happen all at once. <laughs> It, it, it happens incrementally and you find sensory systems developing, you find cardiovascular systems developing, and we can see in living organisms so many of the forms that are indicative of what was going on earlier in the systems. But from a genetic level, one of the things that's so significant about genetics since at least the 1990s is that it's difficult to see many examples of really interesting genetics that's not way preceding the morphological variation. And in just recently, uh, there's a thing that's going to be discussed in the, in the Tiktaalik uh, discussion that um, uh, one scientist noted that about 80% of the stuff that's needed to make a human being is occurring in the fish lineage from the structures to developing the, the bones and the connections to them and the various genetic things and the various uh, arches in the uh, body and all the rest and the genes that are regulating them. Uh, all 
are occurring long before they even get into the tetrapod crawling up on the land stage. And then it's a manifestation of how those things vary and adjust over time as specializations occur and things start, they drop off this and add on that and a slight little re variation on that. And uh, um, Jackson is certainly aware. Oh, uh, the, um, well, rocks do have a section on how the X can't agree or even contradict. Uh, it, it brings up in various contexts. So we bring up the heat issue uh, because that just keeps not going away. Uh, the selection issue, Gulli uses uh, CET theory that pops up in an area. And then uh, one that I'm particularly fond of is when did the flood happen? <laughs> if all you do is follow one apologetic niche, which is if you read ICR and AIG and CMI, uh, they pretty much toe the line on 2350 BCE for the flood, uh, 2348. And what is going on is they're following Bishop Usher's calculations. Uh, but it turns out that that has a there's a huge amount of dispute as to how to arrive, even using the method of just toting up the patriarchs. It depends on which translation you use. It depends on which section of the Bible you used. And this is well known in not only standard biblical apologetics, but if you look really closely at some of the creationists, they are aware of this too. And all of that's going to be in uh, the sections about how the confusion that we're, and we're not talking a minor amount of time. We're not talking about 50 or 100 years. In some cases, we're talking thousands of years range as to when they think certain things happen. And it all depends, of course, as to when you peg the age of the earth. And so it, it, depending upon if you're pegging stuff to Adam and then calculating out from there, it's a mess. Um, Areas that will be coming up in a future book on the development and evolution of religion, pretty much I'm leaving out. There is a little bit of discussion of Sodom and Gomorrah because that has catastrophic um, uh, young earth uh, flood geology issues. And in fact, there are little camps as to where was Sodom? Is it down on the dark, uh, on the um, Dead Sea or is it farther north at Tel El Amman? And there's big disputes about that going on in, in the footnotes in the creationist literature. And there's some really wacky people who are hovering around the edge of standard archaeology as well. Oh, I'm getting a stupid note about my windows to turn the thing. I don't want to do that. Oh, yikes. I do not want to restart, and I do not want to start in five minutes. Oh, okay. Um, yikes, what do we got going here? Well, I'm at 42 minutes on here, so I'm going to have to go to, to uh, leave to be able to tell the damn computer not to shut itself off. <laughs> and do its stupid little update. So I think I pretty much covered a lot of that. Let's see what we've got um, in, um, yes, that stupid little window won't even disappear on here. So, okay, um, uh, I'm going to uh, shut the stream down so I can fiddle with this damned update uh, alert and get that out of the way. As soon as the um, uh, video is posted, I'll uh, slip in the various uh, links so everyone can follow on there and then we will see all of you kids next week and Ian, what a perfect time of day for you. We'll be able to see you next week in that too. So, okay, everybody's take care. There's a lot of heat problems going on in very Europe's burning up. We've got a giant heat wave all over the United States. It's fairly manageable. We're at seasonably warm weather here. We're starting to go into the 80s and 90s, which is normal July weather for Spokane. Um, and uh, thanks to my niece and, uh, and her husband, they installed a little air conditioning thing to pump uh, cool air around in the back end of the house so I can keep things down to a fairly manageable level. For some reason, they don't want me to broil. I, I don't know why. Anyway, so we'll see you all next week, kids. Uh, everybody stay safe and um, uh, avoid Omicron. Okay.